the next few weeks, we're, we're going to start to get into kind of making some visual arts. And today we're going to get into this idea of visualizing neural networks and then exploiting their ability to be visualized to create interesting sort of procedures for making uh, visual artworks, let's say. And um, we'll, next week we'll, we'll get into generative models, which are, you know, you might be tempted to conflate them because they're just, you know, neural networks making interesting images, but they're actually categorically different. So the things that we'll look at today actually use a very different way of generate, like what you're looking at now is, is using a very different technique than a generative model in that it uses a neural network inside of a larger sort of optimization based scheme. And I'll talk about what that means exactly in just a few slides. And then generative models are actually like neural networks that produce images directly. And so that's kind of like the, um, the difference between these two. Um, just a little bit of the what to expect over the next few weeks. So this is a tentative schedule between now and, and roughly the end of the semester. And th this is going this is going to change a little bit probably, but but this is kind of where where things seem to be headed right now. So like I said today, we'll we'll talk about this uh, these optimization based methods, and that includes Deep Dream, which probably most people are already casually familiar with, and also uh, texture synthesis and, and style transfer. And I mean style transfer. Style transfer is a little bit ambiguous now because it can refer to multiple techniques that that are actually quite different. But the original quote unquote style transfer was using an optimization based uh, technique very similar to Deep Dream. So that's what we're going to get into today. And it's very closely related to this idea of generating textures, which is important for all sorts of things, right? So, you know, you can think of like uh, generating textures for video games, generating textures for, you know, graphics and so on. Um, so we're going to get into those things today. And then next week we're going to basically like the, the following two to three weeks roughly will be devoted to generative models and generative models are more or less like representational models of data sets we're going to mostly focus on images but but we'll also talk about sound and text models as well and next week we'll kind of introduce them and talk about what generative adversarial networks are and uh, variational autoencoders you might already be familiar with some of this tech, uh, terminology and we'll also talk about certain like grunt work let's say utilities like for example, how to collect the data set, um, how to pre-process the data set and so on. Um, the, so that'll be next week. Uh, and then the week after that, we'll probably get into things like picks to picks and cycle again. So image to image uh, networks and um, getting further along into let's say like the second half of, of the following week or even week eight, we'll start to talk about some of the more exotic varieties of generative models. There's all sorts of like uh, very specialized um, models for, for different things, right? So like text to image, image to text, you know, sound to image and all this, all this kind of stuff. And we're going to try to include as many of them as, as we can and, and include tutorials on how to, uh, how to actually run them. And then basically, um, depending on how long that goes, somewhere between week eight and week nine until week 10, we are going to, uh, and maybe that'll even bleed into week 11, we're going to then start to talk about sort of miscellaneous topics that don't necessarily uh, aren't necessarily like uh, fit under a, a, a one rubric. Like, well, we want to talk about language modeling and recurrent neural networks, LSTMs that people are already using. Like, maybe you want to know a little bit more about how they actually work. Um, so that's going to be part of week eight to week ten. Um, audio and text applications as well, and um, we'll see about reinforcement learning. Like reinforcement learning, I'll definitely talk about at some point. How much practical material we get in, we fit into the course is it kind of remains to be seen. There's definitely like um, I think a lot of potential for reinforcement learning to become uh, a big module. Of course, like the fact that we're introducing it so late in the semester may make it a little tricky to to integrate into final projects and stuff. But I definitely want to show you stuff from reinforcement learning because it's very much like um, maybe one of the most exciting areas in in machine learning in general. And then uh, week 11 is kind of TBD right now. Uh, I have some ideas for things that I want to show you that, that are a little bit out of left field. And we, it may end up being the case that we just kind of take the stuff between week 8 and week 10 and just and subsume week 11 part of it. Um, but there's definitely a few things that we might get into. Like, for example, I'm interested in telling you more about decentralized machine learning. So there's a lot of really interesting new technologies for how to create uh, machine learning models that are distributed in non-traditional ways, like let's say serverless, peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, 
uh, networks, uh, encrypted and private machine learning. There's all this stuff that doesn't necessarily fit under the rubric of machine learning for artists, but is nevertheless very, very interesting. And I think, and, and possibly the basis of what I'm going to continue to do here next semester. So that's kind of worth getting into. And then also, I think we'll include um, uh, some more practical information about how to take what you learn from this class and apply it moving forward, like how to keep up with the field, how to read research papers, how to uh, participate in the sort of community that's gathered around uh, around these tools. Um, that's all stuff that I'll include in week 11. And then week 12 will basically be final projects. And that'll be kind of like what we did today. So today was a little bit of a dress rehearsal, but week 12 will devote entirely to projects. So everyone will have more time. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll maybe like, um, yeah, we'll, we'll obviously like that's, that's already like two months from now. So we can kind of like talk about the specifics later in the semester. Um, any, any questions? Yeah. So you're still planning on putting up uh, like a terrible signal? Yeah, um, that's what I'm going to do tonight, hopefully, um, because basically part of getting into the, st the territory that we're going to get into now is um, that you'll need to have some basic literacy with terminal and running you know python scripts and, and bash and, and all this kind of stuff and um what i'm and we're not going to have time to do it right now but what i'm planning on doing is actually re uh, recording an additional addendum to this lecture uh, which will include information about that stuff so that's going to be a um, 50 percent chance that that i have it online tonight i have a really late flight to catch but i think there's a good chance that it'll it'll get online um, yeah. Do you know what the date is of our week 12 class? Oh, it's, it's the, it's, uh, I think December 11th. Okay. Yeah. So it's the last Tuesday of the, of the calendar. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, okay. Well, all right. Well, let's, let's, so we have roughly an hour, so I'm going to try to, um, Kind of introduce this topic from a theoretical perspective and then uh, like i said we'll, the practical materials i'm going to actually record separately and just add them later so for now you can just you know this will just be a lecture so first of all let's just like quickly review the, all of the most important the most salient um uh, you know uh, it, the most salient characteristics of neural networks that we need to understand the material um, neural networks are these data structures which form representational models of images and text and you know sound and whatever other kinds of data sets that you can you know plug into them and uh, we learned about certain properties that they have right so like in the one layer neural network we learned that you can let's say visualize the weights we, we, we these are visuals that we showed in the last few weeks so if you visualize the weights of a one layer neural network trained on let's say MNIST you uh, and then you actually visualize the weights themselves, you might start to see something like this, where the weights associated with a particular neuron, which is tasked with classifying zeros, for example, will actually learn something about what a zero looks like, right? Because it's, it has to learn the features that are useful for it to classify each of those numbers, right? And that's kind of a hint of the things that we're going to look at today. You're, we're able to, each of these neurons is forming, you, you could say is, is able to extract like a representation or, or, or is looking for a particular feature. And uh, in the one layer neural network, the features that are the classes, right? Because there's only one layer of processing. And so these are the outputs. And so the features they learn must necessarily be the entire classes. But let's say, uh, and so you get something like this, but let's say you have two layers, then the network might in the first layer learn uh, like the top row there it might learn more abstract features that are kind of more generally useful so in a two-layer neural network you can kind of combine features learned in the first layer you can combine them in the second layer to get composite features let's say um, and so this is what this this is what uh, this demo and you can see the demo online this is what this demo is all about so you have these these more abstract features learned in the first layer, things like strokes and loops and, you know, um, like basic, you know, uh, basic features, let's say. And then those are being combined to, in the second layer, to, lear to, uh, uh, to uh, learn the representation of the actual digits. And this is useful because um, many of the numbers share features, right? Because nines and eights both have a loop at the top, right? 
Um, and so it's useful, and, and this is very much how the visual cortex of, of humans works, it's useful to learn these kinds of hierarchical representations where one feature is a combination of multiple smaller features, right? And that is kind of the, um, that was the uh, research, that's what the research found uh, going back all the way to the 1960s, these experiments we talked about a few weeks ago, where they learned that, that mammalian um, visual cortices kind of work this way. So you have the neurons that are most closely attached to your, um, to the retina are just looking for, are basically responding to very simple stimuli, you know, edges, lines, uh, things like that. And then the neurons sort of farther down that those neurons connect to are then combining those into more complicated features like corners or, or parallel lines, um, something some, somewhat more complex patterns. And then this goes in a, in sort of layer by layer, uh, is a little bit more complicated than layers in the actual in the actual mammalian brains, but but there is some um, some overlap. And so you can learn much more complicated features that are composites of uh, smaller features found at a smaller scale. Uh, and and this is a, this turns out to be a very efficient way of, uh, of for visual systems to work because you know it's if you're learning eights and nines, it's very useful to have a single feature to detect loops at the top rather than having them copied for each of the eight and nine detectors, right? And this is kind of the, uh, the basis for how convolutional layers work. And so we introduced convolutional layers. Uh, when we talked about convolutional neural networks, we saw that in a modern day convolutional neural network, you'll have typically, you know, maybe uh, like over a dozen layers that sequentially process the uh, activations coming from the previous layer where the activations in the beginning are just the original pixels and they form these hierarchical representations of the images uh, where the features are increasingly more and more complicated and features towards the later layers are finding things like uh, entire object categories right so you'll see like for example um, you know you might find faces you know we, we saw there's a face detector in the in the one that's included in the ml4a uh, the open frameworks app and uh, windows and doors and you know all sorts of other features that might be replicated across many classes right so this is kind of like all review right so okay well let's talk about visualization of neural networks and what do i mean by visualization so as deep learning began to become more and more uh, successful there was a lot of discussion about uh, how uh, one of the big things that changed between, let's say, shallow learning and deep learning was that deep learning was now doing what we used to do by hand. So forming feature representations. In, in computer vision, it was very typical to, uh, in the 90s and 2000s, for computer vision to start with a set of programmed feature, uh, feature extractors that are hand programmed by humans to extract things like, and I talked about the different features like hog features, histogram of oriented gradients, right? It would look for the direction, the sort of like vectors, dominant vectors inside of a, inside of an image and then take a histogram of them. And that would form like a smaller, a more compact representation of the image, which would be, um, you know, good enough to go into a shallow machine learning algorithm. And shallow means that it takes, you know, a small vector as its input. And then what happened was that deep learning said, no, we'll just take the raw pixels and we will learn the feature representation on the way to the, to the last layer. And um, so, what, so the, the result of this was that suddenly something that we really knew a lot about, feature extraction, was something that the machine was now doing for us. And so, of course, this means that there's a lot more opacity, like it's much more opaque what's happening inside of these machines. Like, what are the features that they're learning? Like, uh, it would be very nice for us to understand better rather than treat the whole thing as a black box, you know, that takes input, produces output, and then it's all a mystery inside, right? And um, some of the first experiments, like people started, began to do experiments as, as early as like, let's say 2009, 2010. Uh, I'm gonna start with these because these are kind of the most, um, uh, the most relevant to what we just saw. So in, this is a really landmark paper in 2013. It was actually done here at NYU. So um, that's uh, Rob Fergus and his student, Matt Zeiler. Um, uh, this was done at uh, the AI lab here at NYU. 
and um, it's a paper called Visualizing uh, Convolutional Neural Networks, and they introduced a number of techniques for trying to visualize them. Um, Matt Zeiler later um, started a company called Clarify, maybe some of you are familiar with, it's a startup here in New York that does like embedded machine learning uh, services, kind of sort of like ML in the cloud. In any case, um, this, uh, they, they wrote this paper that was all about like uh, introducing several techniques. And one of them, one of them that's a relatively simple thing that you can do is, you know, we know that active, like these neurons are lighting up for particular uh, features, right? They're, they're all feature detectors, right? So one thing that you could do is, let's say you have a thousand images, you can forward them all into a neural network and then uh, keep track of the ones that activate a, a particular neuron of interest that activate it the most. Right, so like in the first layer of the network, you have feature detectors that look like this. You know, so some of them are finding patches of green, and some of them are finding checkerboards, and some of them are finding parallel lines, and so on that have a particular angle. And so you can pass many, many images through the network, and then keep track of parts of those images which maximally activated that neuron. So these are actual samples from real images, like real photographs that maximally activated each of these neurons. So the way to read this is that this cell right here that has nine images, these are images that, real images, uh, or parts of real images that activated this feature detector very nicely. And you can see like, it, it should make sense, right? The feature detectors, they're, they're looking for things that look like themselves, right? Um, and so like this one's pretty easy, like the bottom middle one, just patches of green. So there's random patches of green somewhere in the image and this, this cell, this neuron, loves green patches right? and so and so you can kind of see that come out now in now as you do this process in the later layers of the network right you can go to the second third fourth layer um, th at this point you can no longer visualize the actual filters anymore because the fil well, I mean you can but it, it, it doesn't really make sense anymore because the filters are not um, it's not like uh, they're not looking for original pixels anymore. They're combinations of other filters. And they have many, many channels. Now, they're not just colored. They're, they have, might have 200 channels or something. So you can't really visualize them anymore. However, you can still repeat the experiment where you uh, isolate parts of real images which maximally activated those neurons. So for example, I don't remember the, the exact number, but this is, let's say, the second or third layer or something like that, second or third convolutional layer of this particular network. And you can see that you know this cell right here really, really likes these sort of vertical parallel lines, right? Uh, this cell right here is looking for rings. This cell is looking for patches of orange and so on. Do you have a question? Yeah. yeah, I was under the impression that once you're past the first layer, the inputs to the second, third, fourth, et cetera layer would not actually be parts of the image, but would be... Yeah, yeah, it, it's not, uh, it, um, it's activations, but yeah. you can still uh, like, you are still originally forwarding an, an image in the first layer. And so we're running this experiment where we'll forward images through the network. And then if we're interested in the third layer, we'll, we, we can still trace what part of the image activated that particular uh, neuron farther downstream, like after several layers of processing. But we can still say that this, this part of the image made that neuron light up. You notice that the, the actual uh, regions are bigger so they're always getting bigger because like the, you know, these convolutional filters kind of are it's like, you know, okay, the first, in the first layer though, it's a function of a three by three neighborhood. And then that goes into the next layer and that's just a single cell. And there's another convolutional filter that's like a three by three thing. And so that's combining neighboring, what were neighboring cells originally. So like the so-called receptive field, like the, uh, of the, of a particular neuron grows as you go through the network, through the layers of the network. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah? So, I mean, that makes sense, um, and I'm sure it's a rabbit hole, but uh, just like on a high level, how are you actually doing that process of going backwards and figuring out what segment of the image is activating that? You're right, there, there's, there's like, um, so I mean that you can, there's definitely a way of calculating that because um, like, okay, in the first layer, it's, you can see very directly, like you move the patch over the network and you know that this activation is a function of this little neighborhood around it. You mean, by when you say move the patch, you mean like move a segment of the image? Or? 
around as the image? No, remember like in the convolutional demo, you have this like feature detector that you slide across the image. Right, right, right. And then all of the activations are, are you know, yeah, are indexed with the image, yeah. So it, it's the same here. Now, it's a little bit more complicated because now you have multiple layers of processing, but you can still trace it back. Um, but th those are mostly low-level details. For, for, for us, we don't want to necessarily get bogged down in that. Uh, we just want to understand what they're doing. Um, so continuing like this, you're seeing like, okay, perpendicular lines. This is even later, you're seeing more complicated features. So this is kind of interesting. Like you see like what look like lattices or grids, and they're all different colors and different shapes, but they all have something in common, right? Um, they appear to be sort of repetitive lattices, right? So you can have feature detectors that are picking up in, uh, things that are kind of intangible like that, like repetition, right? This is picking up what look like wheels. Um, this is a cool one right here. This is text and barcodes, right? And, and bar barcodes and text in different languages. Um, so that's pretty, that's pretty neat. So there's like a little you know, text detector. This one, I guess, is like upper bodies. Um, and so on. You can kind of like use your imagination, right? They're never explicitly labeled, right? So we're just interpreting them after the fact. Um, so, but, but the point is that every neuron is looking for a particular feature and the features are become more and more abstract as you move through the layers of the network. Right? So um, going back, now we'll actually go back a couple of years. This is from, oh, I actually don't have the year. I think it's 2010 or 2009. Um, I think I, I actually did a little bit of research there and I traced it back. I think this is the first paper to do this. I'm not 100% sure. Um, I'd love for someone to actually do a research, uh, research project on this. Um, uh, Karen Simonian. So basically, um, they, uh, they said, okay. And, and of course, like the, the thing that, that, um, Zyler and Fergus did was not, uh, not necessarily something that no one thought of before. Okay, you can do these uh, techniques where you m look at patches of images which maximally activate a neuron. But a more interesting question, <laughs> uh, interesting, let's say, to an artist, um, is instead of taking real images and forwarding them through the network and then, and then saving whichever one's activated a particular neuron, could you do it in reverse? Say, um, like synthesize an image which would maximally activate a particular neuron, right? So like for example, this is the idea here. This, this, this image right here is synthesized, right? And this image, if you forward it through their neural network, it would maximally activate the neuron that is responsible for classifying goose, right? And this would maximally activate the neuron responsible for classifying ostrich and limousine, right? Kit fox computer keyboard it's very abstract but you can kind of see like okay i see keys right um i see random sort of washing machine like artifacts right bird like parts here dumbbells um cups dalmatians you see all the check like the spots um so this is model specific right yes yeah yeah <clears throat> so um now how and actually then i think two or three years later this was, I think, also one of the first times that this technique actually got recognition in, in media. Uh, because This was a, still a few years before Deep Dream. So there was this like um, uh, Google, Kwak Le, who was a researcher at Google at the time, and his team like scraped YouTube videos, tons of YouTube videos. This is 2000, uh, I think 2012. They scraped a whole bunch of YouTube videos and they used this technique to synthesize an image which maximally activated the cat neuron and then uh, this this got a lot of press because everyone loves cats it's 2012 and it was like Google's uh, this is what Google's AI thinks cats look like so this is like the first wave of like press for this technique yeah so was this network doing classification though the network was trained for classification so yeah. they're able to like have the end classify and say we cat exactly yeah no uh, and then this was like the face neuron right um now, how this works, and we're actually, like, again, we won't get it too much in DLs right now. I'm going to include a tutorial on, on deep dream and neural synthesis, uh, like, in the addendum to this. But just roughly speaking, like, um, the technique is actually very, very similar to uh, the way neural networks are actually trained. 
So a neural network is trained. You have this fixed set of da data set of images, and you have a neural network where the weights are parameters. And so you use gradient descent to tweak the parameters iteratively, and uh, you tweak them in such a way that they, they optimize the classification accuracy. Something like that, right? That's, that's gradient descent, yeah? Sorry, I'm just, just to go back, is this, like, did anybody point out the sort of, like, inherent bias in, in the image set here? Because that, that face looks very much like a, a white Yes, image. plenty of people have <laughs> pointed that out, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, I mean yeah. like, when it came out, was that, like, was oh, that the I mean, beginning? Well, probably not, because, like, at that time, yeah. it was mostly a curiosity. No one really cared about machine learning in 2012, except for, like, researchers in, in, in the industry. Like maybe I mean like uh, you know it's probably in like a few publications. I'm not I'm not actually sure that the face one got into press. I think the cat one did, um, because there's like you can see I think articles like from Wired or something or you know that's like showed the big it's like a huge picture of the blown up cat, and I don't know about the face. This is just in the paper. Um, this this image I got from the paper. Sorry. No, it's just, it looks exactly like the, the. Have you seen David Lynch's Lost Highway? Uh, no, I it have looks not. Exactly like the kind of demon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, um, so just getting back to how these are made. So neural networks trained, right? You hold the parameter. The parameters are learned. The weights of the network are learned by doing gradient descent and updating them iteratively in such a way as to optimize classification accuracy. With this, it's very similar. You're also doing gradient descent, except now... It, the weights themselves are fixed, and it's the pixels that are that are tweaked iteratively until it optimizes a particular objective, and the objective that it's optimizing for is maximal activation, right? So the desired activation state is is 100% for this particular neuron, and um, generally speaking, zero for the others, and so you can tweak the pixels iteratively over and over and over so as to make those activations go and go more towards the desired state. That's something roughly how this works. It's very much worth like reading this because the first paper does a very simple, uh, like does, does it in the most simple way. Like this technique has actually undergone uh, some more revisions over the years. And so now there's more complexities thrown into it. But this is kind of the so-called naive approach, which is just optimizing the pixels so as to maximally activate um, the particular neuron that, that you're interested in. Now, this took a big step forward in 2015. Uh, probably this is something that a lot of people here remember. Maybe this is, this is what kick-started your interest in this topic to begin with. Um, I traced this back to like when this was uh, personally a big moment for me because I was doing a lot of machine learning and I was doing a lot of new media art, but I was like, but they felt kind of like asynchronous, let's say, like two different pursuits. I had various projects that are trying to bridge the two, but, but it was never like necessarily, um, there was never necessarily that much interest in it, I guess. But basically in 2015, when people started seeing this, it was like, oh wow, neural networks can be used for generative art. Um, and so I think this was when the new media art community more generally and the art tech community more generally began to take interest in, in machine learning. Um, when uh, with the release of this and, and like style transfer and a few other things from that year. And uh, there was a blog post by Google by these three uh, guys who were working at Google at the time, Alex Mordvinsev, Chris Ola, and Mike Taika. And um, basically Alex Mordvinsev was, was the person who kind of is credited for coming up with this technique uh, that we're going to show in, in a second. Um, and 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 Chris Ola actually, is, um, may, many of you have probably seen some of his writings. He's a really, really like, great writer. He's very interested in science communication. And Mike Tyka, uh, Mike Tyka was actually not even doing machine learning at, at Google at the time. He's, he's actually more interested in like, computational biology and neuroscience. But he uh, developed a lot of the first, like some of, some of the like, artistic techniques associated with it. In any case, um, the idea here was, well, first of all, they, they first introduced, they first kind of rehashed this, this um, technique, uh, except they, they added a few kinks to it. Uh, they made it look a lot better. So you can kind of see like the colors are a little bit more vivid. You know, the, these look like very sort of like, there's a lot of noise, like high frequency noise kind of. And here they're much more vivid and the features are a little bit more, more visible. 
Part of that is because the networks were just you know a lot better already. They had more images and they had more parameters and so on. This is already the deep learning age. Um, but another aspect of it, it was that they introduced several techniques for getting it to look a little better. And we'll, we'll actually, when I introduce the neural synth notebook, we'll see some of them. But in any case, they showed, okay, like rehashing this. So you can visualize ants, measuring cups, bananas, parachutes. It's kind of interesting. You can see that there's a person inside of the picture. Um, and this is kind of what you might call sample bias. So pictures that are labeled as parachutes have a lot of other things in them. You know, people are usually hanging off those parachutes. So it kind of learns like a representation of parachute that includes people somewhat. Um, dumbbell is, oh, they don't, uh, we don't have dumbbell here, but there's another, they have an image of dumbbells and, you know, dumbbells are like the things that you, you know, <laughs> lift with and, and it has like sort of arms attached to it. It's really wild, um, really kind of cool. And um, so then, uh, then there was, okay, so then Alex Mordvinsev came up with the idea of Deep Dream. So what is Deep Dream? So this is an image of one of my favorite places. I'm not going to reveal where it is, but maybe some of you might know. Uh, but this is what happens when you deep dream it. Yeah. Look at that. So what is deep dream exactly? How does it relate to this? It's very similar to this. So the idea with deep dream is that instead of having a desired activation state, which you then optimize the pixels for, you instead do the following. You start with a real image, like a, a canvas containing a whole image, and then you throw it into a neural network and observe its activations. And then you do pixel gradient descent to make all of the activations, all of them, bigger. So you try to amplify the activations. So you have all these feature detectors that are finding patterns in the image, right? And they might find a little bit of this pattern. And so you tweak the pixels to make the activations, the, the patterns that it finds, more. So it enhances patterns. It actually like finds pattern and like even little bits of patterns and enhances them. And so you start to get, see things like this, right? And this is crazy because you see all these like, like capsules and cars and like pagodas and trees and all of these different things, right? And of course the famous dogs, like this was the thing that Deep Dream was well known for, dogs. The reason why there's so many dogs or puppy slugs as we call them. Um, the reason why there's so many was because um, the Inceptionism Network has like like 200 breeds of dogs or something. That might be an exaggeration, but it's just like it has all these dog breed neurons, and so like it learned a lot of dogs. Um, but in any case, like it's pretty wild, right? And 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 you well yeah well this of course like the internet lost its mind you know the, like when Deep Dream came out because not only did the not only was this crazy images but they also released the software so like I made this right I made this with software that they released they just put it online like anybody can just you know download the model and actually run this code and just apply it to an images images and and actually like they didn't used to do that before so this was also one of the big things that changed in 2015 is that researchers began to share code um, which is pretty nice of them. They don't necessarily share all the models all the time, but good enough, right? Um, and so Alex Mordvinsev kind of came up with that idea, right? He was like, oh, why don't we, instead of uh, specifying the, neur uh, the neurons we want to enhance, we just, we just enhance all of, the, all of the ones that are already found, right? And there's like various degrees of freedom. You can, okay, and you can kind of see that here. So you see this is, these are two different deep dreams of the same image. And the difference between them is that this one the, neuro, the activations that we're enhancing are actually in the early layers of the network. So the early layers are detecting just things like um, edges, right? Edges and, and, and corners and like simple pixel patterns. And that's why this looks like just like kind of edges. And then the later layers are finding more complicated features. So you see eyes and dog faces and stuff. And so you can actually choose which layers of the network you want to enhance and you can ignore the others, right? And there's all sorts of ways you can tweak this, but th that's kind of like the big category of ways that you can get uh, more results. So this is another example, like, okay, like you see the one left is, um, that's actually what I look like in the morning. Um, yeah. so, <laughs> so this is enhancing later, later layers, right? And then this one is enhancing earlier layers, right? And by the way, this is almost running real time. I'm, I'm actually was made, made that with Darknet, uh, the OFX Darknet, which we made for open frameworks. Uh, it's not quite real time, but, but it's, but it's kind of close to it. In any case, like, yeah, pretty hideous. So 
Alex Mordvinsev, um, if if uh, uh, I'm gonna actually show some more of his work, he he he's really like I think credited with with the deep dream technique in principle. He made a lot of these like amazing images, like really really vivid stuff. Um, didn't even it didn't get as much attention. Like like I think it kind of got lost in the shuffle of deep dream more generally and like the the blog post. And so some of this stuff is not not even necessarily like that prominent, but it was it's like really cool. I think some of the first really interesting, amazing images making using this technique. And you know, you can just like use your imagination. You just see all sorts of stuff happening here. Right? It's like, it's really wild. Um, now I'm gonna show some more, some of Mike Tyka's work. So Mike Tyka was also involved in making Deep Dream and Mike Tyka really, really like extended this technique in a lot of ways. And, and I actually, a lot of my work with this technique has been kind of riffing off of his techniques. So what he did was uh, he said, okay, like, you can put in a real image and maximally activate the neurons. But what if you just put in a random image, just like start with complete random white noise, right? Um, just random pixels. And you apply the deep dream process to random pixels instead of starting with a photograph or something like that. So that's kind of cool because then, uh, you know, it has to find patterns somehow. And the, the activations will be all very, very small because there's just no, it's all noise, very little signal, very few features to find. But the activations will be, you know, scraping the bottom of the barrel, but there will be some activations that are bigger than others. And so if you apply this technique to Deep Dream and do it over and over and over, it just takes these activations and finds somewhat random, like almost arbitrary patterns and then just completely amplifies them. And that's what you're seeing here. You're just seeing like, random noise thrown into deep dream and it just begins to hallucinate you know like like uh as though like serious you know like a neural network on drugs basically right like just hallucinating like whatever fragments of its imagination that that it can kind of conjure up right um and he also introduced it uh he, oh i guess i think i might be oh, i'm missing some okay i'll i'll show this in the i think it's in the notebook but okay he also introduced this idea of like making videos so the way you would do video is that you start with a random image, you know, random noise, and then produce, you know, produce some, uh, you know, deep dream that, and then you basically use that that image as the input to the next round of deep dreaming. And maybe you warp the canvas slightly, maybe you rotate it or you crop it, zoom in, and if you do this over and over, you can create videos, right? Because it's this feedback uh, loop, and it's just endless, right? Um, and canvas distortion and masking and all these other things that Mike, Mike really kind of uh, introduced. And I'm, I'm going to show you that those are things that are all inside the notebook. Um, there was a recent post on distill.pub. I don't have enough time to, to really get into this because we have very little time. But uh, I very much encourage you to read this post, the, the Building Blocks and Interpretability. This is actually written, I think, primarily by Chris Ola. I think there's maybe a few authors here. But um, they really took the visualization techniques that we discussed that, that, Rob, uh, that um, Rob Fergus and Matt Zeiler kind of, kind of uh, introduced in 2013, and they took that to the next level. So they're showing, um, this is a little bit similar to like um, what I showed you, those like weighted, weighted sums of feature, uh, of feature, feature extractors, it, but except this is way more complicated because they're actually drawing the features or they're, they're synthesizing the features using DeepStream. Um, and so they show like, okay, this part of the image, it's finding, it's like a little bit of a, you know, dog ear plus dog face, you know, like a weighted sum of these feature, uh, feature detectors. This is a really, really nice post. Um, definitely like encourage you to read this if you're interested in the technique. So the notebook that I'm going to show you, and I get, uh, I'm going to record it offline. It basically, um, uh, is starts with the, this technique of masking. Um, so here's the idea you can do this deep dream thing on a canvas, right? And it could be random pixels or it could be a photograph. Um, but what you can do is, let's say you do it twice for two different feature, uh, for two different neurons, right? And it's iterative. So it, it, at each iteration, you calculate the gradient, which is the change in all of the pixels that you need to make to enhance that particular feature. And uh, you do this at each step and you do this over and over and over and change the pixels until it kind of converges onto, you know, the, the features that you see. So this is the idea with masking is that you, you don't actually, um, you don't crossfade the output images. You actually multiply the mask 
by like pixel for pixel by the gradient. So at each step, I calculate a gradient based on one neuron, and I calculate a gradient based on a second neuron, and then I actually just attenuate, like I multiply that gradient by a mask. So I kill the gradient on one side, and I let it pass on the other side. And then for the second neuron, I do it the other way around. I let the gradient pass for the second neuron, and I kill the gradient for the first neuron. And maybe there's a sort of interpolation, right? So like you have this black to white and white to black. And what happens is that if you do this, at, and not on the output image, but at the, on the gradient at each step, what happens is kind of cool because what, it, like the network is kind of incentive or the, the process is incentivized to come up with pixels that somewhat satisfy both of the neurons at the same time, like somewhat. So in the middle, you see there's like a gradual blending of one type of feature into the other type of feature. And this is kind of the basis, the main uh, basis for the notebook that I'll show you um, that lets you now combine features and actually compose with them because you can make custom masks, right? So here, this is, this is a, a version of this, right? So there's two different neurons that are being visualized. One is kind of finding these sort of weird eggs on the right side. And the thing in the left is, I don't know what you want to call that. But then what's in the middle is kind of like a little bit of both, right? And you see that it finds that there's a really, really gradual change in the features from you know, left to right or from right to left. And that's, that's again using this sort of left to right mask. You can also make like circles as masks, right? So here you have sort of these flowers on the outside and then in the middle you have these like bird wing type things. Um, this is then doing this with video, right? So what's happening here is that I'll make one image and then I'll take the canvas and I'll distort it somehow. I'll distort it by maybe cropping it outward or, or you know, just moving the pixels out. And then I'll run the process again on that and save the frame. And then I'll do the same thing. Like I'll just keep doing this in the row and I'll change the masks as I go. There's just a lot of things that you can do. And in this network that I'm using, that's the Inceptionism network, there's 7,500 neurons. So there's like so much you can do. Yeah? So how come everything that we see with like Deep Dream and it feels like every single part of the canvas has like every single color. Like, mm -hmm. is there any way to like? Well, I don't know. This is kind of like greenish tinted, no? I know, but it's like at the same time, there's this sort of like rainbowy like just feel that everything seems to have. Um, well, I mean, you know, I, okay. So part of it is because this is kind of speculation, right? But but part of it is that you know the the whole idea of neural networks is that they're um, they're detecting high level features. And color is a low level feature, right? It's detecting dogs regardless of what color they are. And so the actual classes should be roughly um, invariant to color. And so then at some point, maybe it ends up being almost like a runaway process. Like, um, I don't know, it's, it's kind of hard to say. Like, like if, if there's some color in one area, it's not necessarily gonna try to change it. Uh, because you can have a red dog and a blue dog, or you know, maybe not a blue dog, but you know, um, it's somewhat invariant color. I would say there's still kind of you know color distributions that are visible. Um, also, I'm picking things that are kind of colorful, um, but yeah, it's a hard question to answer. It's very vivid. You can change that. There's ways of, of changing that. But it won't invent color. Like, I think if you give it uh, like you know, it's from the data. Um, sort, sort of. I mean, like, well, certainly you can't invent colors because there's only so many colors that you can have. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it is ultimately, everything is ultimately a function of the data set. So if, yeah. if I fed in, uh, let's say I had all of the images that fed into the data set and they were made monochromatic. Yeah. Would I still, like, but uh, I used the exact same production methodology afterwards. Would I still end up with something colorful or would this also be monochromatic? Uh, no, I mean, if you trained it entirely on something that's monochromatic, then, then it's not going to end up colorful. Yeah, it, it will it will learn black and white features. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And the size of the pattern also seems to be relatively uniform. Is that based on the size of the, like, individual... Um, it's based on a few things. We'll see in the notebook that you can actually control the, the, the scale that on which features are visualized. So that's part of it, uh, but but also like neural networks, the feature descriptors are fixed in size, 
So, so there is a, some limitations associated with that. However, there's you can stretch it, like, and we'll see in the notebook how that's done exactly. We won't do it in this lecture, but but I'm gonna add that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, other things you can do is like, okay, like you can use these masks, and you can you can make the masks however you want. So originally, I made masks that were like shapes, you know, circles and gradients and whatever. But like, you can segment an image. And then use that as the mask, right? So like I segmented a picture of myself and it found my hair and that, that becomes a mask. And then, you know, my face became another mask. And so I associate different neurons with those. And so you can create these kind of natural looking neural selfies. Um, that's what's going on here. So the thing in the left is actually the Mona Lisa as well. That's probably visible enough. Bonus points for anyone who can recognize the guy on the right. Yeah, yeah, Mikun, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so he was a professor here. I guess technically he still is, but he's spending most of his time on Facebook. I just met him last week, actually. And uh, these are looping. These are loops. You notice that? Ooh, that's something that, that you will, that I will also show. Um, actually, like that I might not be able to show today because I, I'm still working on like getting the, what I described the technique of, it's not going to make any sense right now, but when I describe the technique, I'll, I'll show how to do that. And I'm going to try to put software in line that, that does it. Um, in any case, yeah, perfect loops. You're going to start to see some more of those. Okay, so like style transfer. Now, style transfer is a little bit of an ambiguous term now because, for example, pix to pix is kind of like a style transfer in, this, in a sense. But uh, originally, the term kind of was applied to uh, okay, so originally, originally, so first of all, what is style transfer, right? It's like recomposing one image in the style of another. So this is the Mona Lisa in uh, Picasso style, Van Gogh style, Monet style, right? And this, these are all made using neural style by Justin Johnson. This is, I've used this software all the time. I'm actually going to show give you a tutorial of it. And um, originally, the idea of style transfer was associated with this paper that came out in 2015 by um, uh, this researcher in Germany named Leon Gattis, uh, and it's called a Neural Algorithm or Artistic Style. And um, this paper uh, basically demonstrated this technique where, okay, you can take an image like this is their university, and then the university in the style of this painting, and the university in the style of Edvard Munch, and the university in the style of uh, Starry Night, and so on. That, and um, and it uses a technique that's very, very similar to Deep Dream. Now there's actually ways of doing uh, style transfer I within, uh, in a completely different way, which is much more closely connected to generative models, which we'll, which we'll look at next week. But this is, but I'm describing the original. I actually still really, really like the original technique because the optimization-based technique is very slow. However, it, 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 there's a lot more that you can tweak with it, let's say, and it produces like much better cooler looking images if you're interested in style transfer. It's just slow. Um, you can't do it in real time. Uh, we'll, we'll look at like, like okay, when you look at the ML5 style transfer, that's not doing this. Um, the ML5 style transfer is, is a neural network that takes in one image and, and, and spits out another image, right? Whereas this is actually an optimization scheme that uses a neural network similarly to the way DeepDream does it. And I'm gonna show you how in a second. It's really, really versatile. So this is the Mona Lisa in all sorts of painting styles, right? And you can kind of see that it learns features like really, really nicely. It works uh, like almost anything that you give it pretty much. And um, and this is, I have very little time, so I'm, I'm gonna like explain this in the like sh like in the simplest possible way. Don't don't worry too much about these equations. Like I'll kind of describe what's going on. So, so um, here's the idea, right? You have, an in, you have a content image which is the Mona Lisa, right? And you have this style image, which is Van Gogh. And you initialize a canvas that's the same size as the output image. And the idea is to create a Mona Lisa in the style of Van Gogh, right? So that, this is P, this is X, and this is A, right? This is kind of using the original uh, equations in the paper. These are all from uh, a, a neural algorithm artistic style. So the idea is that we want to... Um, the, 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 the idea is that you have this loss formula that you're trying to optimize. The loss formula set is a, a sum, a weighted sum, of the content loss and the style loss. The content loss is the difference, the dissimilarity in between the content of the input image, the content image, and the content of the output image, right? 
and and we'll define what that means in a second. And then the style, and then the style loss is the difference in the style in the style of the output image and the style image, right? Now, content loss is actually relatively simple to understand, and I'm going to play this little animation for you. This is what happens: it's iterative, and at each iteration, we converge upon the features of you know the the optimal result, right? I'll play this again. Oop, sorry. Play this again. Um, you see, it's like gradually changing the pixels, and you get this these activations at the end. Now, what's going on is that the content loss. Is, is actually really simple to understand. It's basically these minus these. It's like the difference between the activations straight up. Um, it's more or less like, like Euclidean distance or cosine distance, I can't remember what they used. And, and these are the activations from a single convolutional neural network which is trained. So you bring in some, some neural network, you know, let's say which is trained to do image classification, so you, you trained for some other completely different purpose. But you can use it as a feature extractor and the idea is that you want the features, the, the activations, to be exactly the same, basically. If, if they're exactly the same, then you have the same content, right, obviously. Um, but, but here you can kind of see the form of the Mona Lisa kind of emerge in these. And if you do a straight subtraction, you'll get a relatively low content loss. Now, the style loss is kind of a little weirder, a little trickier. And um, it never really makes sense the first time you hear it, but and even the researchers say it doesn't make sense to them, but but it works, right? So the style is actually is actually what they used before is what's called a gram matrix. Let's see, I'm doing it in time. Okay. Um, so they use the gram matrix. A gram matrix is um, okay, like um, the elements of the gram matrix are basically like four G of this. It's the correlation between every pair of activation maps. So it's like the correlation between this and this, the correlation between this and this, the correlation between you know this and this, and so on. Like every pair of activations, the correlation between them. So it basically kills space. There's no concept of space anymore, it's just correlation. And so like the best way to think about it is that you can kind of tell that the, these activations have almost the same texture. You see the texture is very similar. Texture, 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 texture. So what happens is that the core, they're very, they, they end up being like each pair of activation maps has a relatively high correlation. And so you get this representation for each of them in the gram matrix and then you do the same thing in like a subtraction. And so you have this style loss and you have this content loss and then um, they're not, they're computed separately. And so you're trying to kind of, you're trying to minimize both of them but you have to decide which one is kind of more relative, the relative importance of them. And that's what these alpha and beta parameters are for. And you'll see when we, when we introduce neural style, you can control these. And, there, and there's actually like, um, well, there's a, they have a lot of importance, right? So if your content loss is, very, is much higher than the style loss, then maybe your style reconstruction will not, be, will not be so good, but you'll get almost the exact same content. Whereas if your style if beta, which is the importance of your style loss, is very high and content loss is very low, then you may not see as much of the original content, but you'll get a better style reconstruction. If alpha is zero, if content loss doesn't matter, then you will have zero of the original content in the image and you'll just have style. And what is that? That's texture synthesis. So if you've ever seen this idea of texture synthesis, it's just contentless style transfer, basically. Um, a style transfer where the content loss uh, the content loss is weighted zero, um, and and again like Deep Dream, it's this iter it's this iterative process. So at every step, it calculates the gradient of the pixels. Uh, sorry, it calculates the gradient of this loss formula with respect to the pixels, and then it changes the pixels slightly in order to make each of those losses go down. So, style transfer. Yeah. Yeah. So um, because my background in architecture, we used to do a lot of 3D modeling, mm -hmm. um, and we, one thing that used to drive us crazy to get, uh, is that a lot of buildings are made out of bricks, and uh, the textures that we would use were, were never big enough to, to cover, to make it look natural, because when you zoom out far enough, you see like just big tiles. And it's, is this like, could I just take a picture of bricks and be like, now make this you know, 10 times the size, and it'll look a little more? You can, yeah, and, and we'll, we'll be showing software how to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, now, uh, yeah, so I just want to show you some, some stuff. First of all, we're running like a, a bit late. I think this class ends at 3.05. Uh, anyone okay if I go until 3.10, let's say? I think in 10 minutes I can kind of wrap this stuff up. 
Um, so if anyone has to leave at 305 exactly, like please do, like I'm not gonna keep you, uh, but I wanna get through these slides. So um, I just show you like some of the things that were made originally with this. I made this video in 2015, like basically restyling Alice in Wonderland. And um, I think this is one, maybe one of the first videos that kind of came out with this technique. Um, and for, and well, yeah, I mean, you can kind of see what's going on here. Like it's really flickery, right? There's kind of like um, this, like, uh, uh, well, yeah, <laughs> well, it, it's flickery because I'm doing each, each image separately. Um, there was a technique introduced later. Actually, let me show that to you. Let me see if I can find, um, there was a technique later that, that it was able to do this in video that let's see if I can find it, um, that you can get, and there's a repository associated with this that actually makes video directly makes video and has very, very consistent like it, cons it uh, preserves the preserves the style consistently across frames, right? So that's like Hokusai. Uh, that's that's a J train in the style of Hokusai. You see how consistent that is. This is a this is using a repository called Artistic Style Transfer, I think, or uh, I think yeah, something like that, uh, by Manuel Ruder, at all. Um, so if anyone's interested in making videos of this, I would use that repository instead. Um, I want to skip some. This is just more video stuff. I want to skip this. You can do. You can mix multiple styles together. So here, I'm actually interpolating between multiple styles of Picasso. So it goes from these paintings on the left side, and it gradually interpolates between them. You can actually mix styles together. Right. So that's another technique that you can kind of exploit with this. Um, I've been parading this like uh, installation around called Cubist Mirror. It's exactly what it sounds like. Basically, like, turns you into Hokusai, turns you into Picasso, and so on. That's my friend Lassie. <laughs> um, now, this is actually different. Like I said, like, you see how fast it is. This is not using the original technique that uses optimization because it would be too slow. It's actually using a neural network that goes directly from input to output. So this is actually irrelevant slightly to, to, the, to the major theme of today. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of skip it, but it's just worth knowing that you can kind of do that as well. Now, texture synthesis, all this is, this right here, so this Google Maps, right? Just like text, just synthesizing like fragments of what looks like Google Maps. If anyone can tell, it's kind of overfit to California or to San Francisco. But in any case, like um, all this is, is the same repository that made the last video that you saw, um, it, except it's using, uh, it's, it has a, a content loss of, a content weight content loss weight of zero. So you get rid so the, then the content doesn't matter anymore, it's just the style. And so you get texture synthesis. So it's the same repository, right? Um, there's this artist in, in, in Berlin named Sofia Crespo. There's a little bit of a shameless plug. We're, we're teaching a workshop together in, um, in Berlin next month, but she's doing all sorts of stuff with texture synthesis right now. It's really worth like, really like taking this technique all over the place. And so I really like this image actually. Um, and this is just some more of our work. Um, yeah, check that stuff out. Um, texture synthesis, like loops. Okay, so this is again three seconds long. This is a little bit of a secret sauce, but I will show you how, how to do this stuff um, just as soon as I get the software online. Um, yeah, I'm quite happy with this. This is probably the, like, the coolest thing for me that I've made this year is this little looping technique. So this is like endless hokusai. It just goes on and on and on. It's three seconds long. I love Hokusai, like this, I keep returning to the same, I keep using the same inputs over and over and over. Um, Kandinsky, again, endless loop. You can, uh, yeah, chalkboards and stuff. So you can also, like again, like, there's another thing you can do with texture synthesis. So here I got like 20 images by Jackson Pollock. And you know, Jackson Pollock has a particular style. And so then you can actually do a collage of all of them using texture synthesis. Because if you input multiple styles, what it ends up doing is it basically just averages the gram matrices. And so you end up getting features like of all of the images in various places fitting together. So that's Jackson Pollock, Frida Kahlo. Do you see like random eyebrows and noses and like, because <laughs> everyone knows what, yeah, what Frida liked to paint like. Salvador Dali, it's like super surreal. There's like weird clocks, like randomly melting. Um, George O'Keefe very well known for making flowers, um, paintings of flowers close up. 
Um, this is really awesome. This is by Alex Morton and stuff. I don't have that much time, but actually, there's just a couple of slides left, so I'm almost done. Um, this is by this is what Alex, um, so who, original creator of Deep Dream, he submitted this to Nips last year. This is really cool. So check this out. It just starts to zoom in and then it converges on an actual painting. Right? So it'll stop there and then it'll begin to go again. It's really cool, right? And this does this does goes on for a really long time. Uh, I don't have time to look at the whole thing, but it's super cool. Um, so yeah, I highly encourage you to to. And it's very closely related to, to the technique we we're looking at. Um, this is another post by Distill. People should really read this thing. It's a really really like beautiful like very beautiful like um, bunch of articles that they post like one one every month or two. Um, on various things, so they talk about diff various ways of optimizing. Um, optimizing these, well, okay, so these optimization-based techniques like deep dream and style transfer, you uh, uh, there's there's various ways of extending it, and they have they actually have notebooks you can run in the browser, Colab notebooks, um, to actually run these, uh, which is really cool. So they show ways of let's see, like okay, generating video. I have a slightly different way of doing this, but okay, you can get interpolation between frames in a nice way. You can um, what is this? Um, this is style transfer. Oh, different architectures. Okay, that's straightforward. Um, oh, CPPNs. So compositional pattern producing networks. These are neural networks that are basically trained to take positions, like XY positions, and produce colors. Right. So you can actually train a neural. I have a notebook in the ML for A collection that's like a very simple version of this. But basically, like you can train a neural network to take to predict the color based on the pixel position. And you can actually like try to combine that with Deep Dream, and it actually looks really cool. Like these are, these are all like these patterns that they produced with this technique. It's like it's basically Deep Dream through a CPPN, um, and they again they have notebooks for doing this. It's really like really easy to run in the browser, um, and then this is the coolest. Oh, the, adding transparency. Uh, and then this is the coolest thing. So this is. Uh, oops, um, whoa. <laughs> this is basically on top of seamless uh, optimization on top of 3D models, right? Which is really cool inside the browser. Uh, that's the Stanford Bunny. So that's creating a, a new map? Yeah, exactly, yeah. And then this, uh, oh, and then they have the same thing uh, with style transfer, I think. Yeah, so this is like Kandinsky Stanford Bunny. Um, so this is all really cool. So they, they really uh, expanded on Deep Dream using uh, a new package that they have called Lucid. Um, so Lucid is kind of like new and improved Deep Dream. So it's very, I haven't really played with it, but it's definitely like, if you're interested in this technique, I would definitely look, look through that. Um, so that's that. And uh, yeah, that's it. So basically, oh, we're actually, okay, done on time. Okay, so basically next week we're going to like uh, we're going to get into generative models, which are the difference is that these are now neural networks trained on images that output images straight up, and you can see that they're hyper realistic now. This is all just from a few weeks ago, um, so we're going to get into some like really heady territory. It's going to be very exciting these next few weeks. Um, like I said, I'm I'm gone uh, from tonight until until uh, basically on Monday. So for those who want to show me midterm presentations, please come by on Monday or or like sometime before or maybe maybe Tuesday is better. Uh, but sometime before the end of next week, I'd like to see you guys. And uh, that's all. So, yeah, see you guys uh, next week. Ciao. Yeah, thanks.